I have to say, um, what are the advantages of working eight years on one subject? Like you work in a laboratory to cure a disease. Um, what are the advantages of staying with one thing that long? You know, and uh, I think the main hope that I wanted for this nation was that when they saw truth, they would recognize it and be able to function and get the elective system back into the hands of the people. Have you found that in talking to people, May, that uh, that they do recognize truth? N no, I, I, that is a sad situation. <clears throat> people do not yet accept the fact of what happened in Dallas, and they write about every subject that's wrong with the nation, and they have not yet accepted these facts or the information of the various researchers. Each person's off on his own trip, and um, he's not ready yet for the truth of what happened that killed John Kennedy or Robert Kennedy or Martin Luther King, uh, that's an, a pitiful situation, and I don't know the remedy. I just keep working and say, well, the facts are here. If you want them, anyone who wants to see them can come to my home, and I'm listed in the phone directory. If you don't want to call through KLRB and leave your name, a lot of people are afraid because of their jobs or situations to leave their names because someone would know who's showing an interest. That's how afraid people are. But I'm not afraid of, of your calling me, and I will welcome people into my home to see the research, and it's there if they want to know what happened. But um, by and large, most people don't want to know. But at my own personal level, I feel that I have been caping up with the times that I live in. Like today's news is part of me. I've cut out 20 articles this morning from two papers. I I understand many things as they're happening. I'm knowledgeable of the 60s and 70s. It has eliminated a generation gap in our family because the children have never been lied to. And they see things in the paper and they see evidence or documents in my home. And we're not afraid to look at them. And I didn't make them up. And it's a guideline for them on how not to be fooled by people in the outside world. And I think of something that happened this week where uh, my daughter was with a gentleman who teaches at the high school, had a group of young people at his home this Sunday night. And he's respected among the young people in the community. He's Mr. Cool. He helps them with their problems, and, and he teaches at the schools, and he had a sort of a seminar group at his home. And he sort of took my daughter aside and said, now, you don't really believe this stuff that your mother says, do you? And you can't believe all this conspiracy thing. How can you live with it and you don't believe it? And um, she was really shocked. She said, well, you don't think that Oswald you know, killed John Kennedy, do you? And this particular teacher said, uh, oh, come now, of course he did. He's, or if he didn't, what difference did it make? And that reaction... I get that a lot. <laughs> yeah. She came home, you know, really sick in the belly. Like, I like this man. And she begged him and his wife, you know, to come over to our home and meet with me, and and she likes him, but she can see what he's doing. He's trying to help young people, and he's helping them just at an individual level, and he thinks that's where it's at. And she sees laws and repressions coming down so heavily that we know when it's time to leave the United States, and we're ready to go, but because other people can't see it. It's not that we don't like it here, but things are coming down every day, and we point them out. And this kind of person makes it necessary for us to leave. Because he can't accept what's happening. So he mentioned to her uh, something about Robert Kennedy. And she, and you don't believe that story, do you, either? And she said, well, don't you know that Sirhan didn't kill Robert Kennedy? And she mentioned the fact that there's ten bullets in the Ambassador Hotel. And even if he shot his gun all eight, there's still ten at the police department in L.A. And this man, you know, just didn't understand that. And she was trying to stick with certain facts that she knew and, and she came home really very crushed, almost ready to cry, like, Mom, you, why don't you have them over? Because they don't know what's going on, and they're trying to help us, and they're trying to help other people in their world, and all they're doing is helping people adjust and become human or humanistic into a mechanical age where the laws are coming down to keep track of everybody, photograph everybody, make information on everybody, intimidate them. And how can you be a human in this kind of world? I got a call 1130 about two nights ago from a boy who listens to the program, and uh, he was going down Carmel Valley Road from Ford Road out to, to Pacific Grove, and he was photographed twice. He was on his Honda. And he said, how do you handle this, and what do you do? And I said, well, 
why did they photograph you? Are you a political? Were you with somebody? What were you doing? And he said, I don't know why, but I was, I got a ticket when I got to Pacific Grove, and I'm going to take it to the court and object to it. And while I stood there, they took my picture again. And I couldn't put together what he was saying, but it was a real fear. And he called me because he had heard the programs, and he thought maybe I could ease some of his fears about what's happening in our society. If you go out in Carmel or down Carmel Valley Road or into Pebble Beach or Monterey, you see every fifth or sixth car is a police car. I don't know what's going to happen on the peninsula or what's going to come down, but there's something very big happening in this area and around the country in certain areas in Los Angeles. It's about ready for a certain bloody turmoil that that's, I got information is going to take place, and something is going to happen here. These police cars are everywhere. I don't know why. But this boy called me, and he's not going to call that teacher who's helping the other people in the area with problems because uh, they don't have the answers, and he knows that I'm coming close to it, and he called for some advice. It's unnerving to, uh, like, I walked out of my front door one day, and there was someone photographing the front door movies. Yeah. And of me standing in my front door. Well, when I left here, Gloria, about three weeks ago, I... I went to Pacific Grove to leave a cassette that we made here to be typed up, and I pulled off a side street, and some friends of mine, um, my daughters, were pulling into the main street I was turning off, and they honked, and we waved at each other. And then they were just shocked because there was a blue truck in back of there was a microphone and somebody talking on the microphone. And they called to tell me, and when I came in here last week, there was a sheriff's car at the corner of my street talking on a microphone, you know, and then pulling up to the corner. I don't know what's happening. I know what's happening, but... Uh, the thing is that if you take the information or the data or the facts on the political assassinations that work down to the local area, and you're knowledgeable, you're not taken by surprise by things later. And I feel that I can handle whatever comes along and try to absorb it, and I may not have all the answers, but I'm not in for the shock that a lot of people are going to have about a year from now or two years from now. And another advantage of working with this material for so long is you develop certain traits. <laughs> you develop a, a persistence or a curiosity, and uh, hopefully you make it useful to somebody. But you believe in something, and you stay with it, and you develop a certain strength in the information. Fitting together, it would be better if it didn't fit together. You know, it would be better a long time ago if the inconsistencies became answered, the questions became answered. But you have a certain feeling of honesty within yourself that is hard to define. That if you have that quality, you know what it is, and you have it about you in your actions or your faith. And if you don't have it, um, you also show those same anxieties. Now, there was a picture in the paper of Ted Kennedy standing over the grave of his brother. And that it, says an awful lot. He, yes, he, he went at 7 in the morning, and he's standing there with his arms crossed, and you get the feeling like he's asking, what should I do? Do I take this one more leap, three boys are dead, and there's one living? Am I going to answer this particular call and show them they can't intimidate me or cow me or dump that girl into the river and do the things that they've done? Do you take that chance or do you stand by all the children of the family that were left behind as the living male? Do you serve your nation or what do you do? I'm not saying that I agree with much of what Ted Kennedy does or what I don't know what's in his head all of the time. We don't know anybody's minds, really. But it's more of a human being that comes through in this picture than the one that was down at Miami talking to the labor this week. Uh, Mr. Meany spoke of Richard Nixon in a way that was frightening where he actually used the word his hatred for the president. Now, even in Dallas, when John Kennedy was killed and certain people in that community were responsible for that murder, they never said they hated him. They accused him of different things. But in the paper this week, the president was accused by George Meany of being a weak and dangerous man. And he said, in quotes, he was shaking like this, and he moved his hands trembling. This is a weak man, and a weak man is a dangerous man, and he's weak because he's scared. And he insists that there have been deliberate deceptions by the Nixon administration. And he was lashing out at Richard Nixon for the position he has taken. George Meany feels that strongly the country is endangered by the president because it was one thing for a strong president to practice symmetry, 
But when he is weak, it is something else. And he is very much afraid of the actions of Richard Nixon. Now, I do not approve of the method of release that people use today of the comedy. The funny movie that's out, Millhouse, or the movie on Trisha's Wedding, or the book by Philip Roth on the gang. I've mentioned these before. Hitler was very funny in the same way. And I don't think that these things are funny. The only funny thing is you people who laugh. Uh, there's something very sick about the silly grin of listening to funny stories or records about Richard Nixon. I have a sense of humor, and I laugh at my work sometimes, and I have a button collection, such as a sterilized LBJ, no more ugly children, and so forth. But LBJ wasn't funny either. There was nothing funny about LBJ or anything he did. And there's nothing funny about Richard Nixon. Now, in case you didn't catch the news this week, on the anniversary of John Connolly's, John Kennedy's death, John Conley was asked uh, his opinions of that particular day. And he said, in quotes, I didn't realize today was November the 22nd. And therefore, if I don't respond, I have no comments further. He looked startled when he was asked about the question and said his energies were on President Nixon's economic program. John Conley was in the car where John Kennedy was murdered. That would be a hard day to forget. I, I can't forget it. Nobody in the nation can forget it. And I think when you work with these pathological liars, and that's what they have to be, John Conley could never forget that day. Nobody standing on the corner forgot it. Certainly sitting in the car, nobody forgot it. Or Mr. Kellerman, the Secret Service man who was sitting in the front seat who said a flurry of bullets came at us. And the commission said, you mean two or three? He said, gentlemen, I've been in this too long. It was a flurry of bullets. And Mr. Greer, who drove the car, never forgot it because he said if he had ever seen the site, he never would have taken that route. They slowed down to 10 or 12 miles an hour and went under a bridge that was unguarded in front of a building that was unguarded. He didn't forget it. He almost went insane and had to retire. He didn't forget the day. <laughs> John Conley is the Secretary of the Treasury because of that day. And his mind adjusts the fact that it never happened. People don't refer to him associating with the Dallas trip. But it was John Connolly and Lyndon Johnson and Clifton Carter who were in El Paso in the early summer, spring, with John Kennedy and said, you are coming to Dallas in the fall to bridge the gap in the Democratic Party. He was one of the men responsible <coughs> for the trip and went to Washington. John Kennedy didn't want to be in that motorcade or be in Dallas, and John Connolly was one of the last men who went to Washington to persuade him to come. And... It is a very nice fact that our brain accommodates to these particular instances. So if he's protecting his gray matter, well and good. But don't you forget that a man who has the power that he has to tie up your taxes and your economy and decisions on wages and prices and rentals, if you can raise your rent or get a raise in salary. John Conley's in that position because of Dallas in 1963. And I will make a prediction to you listening audience, that he will be president of the United States someday. I could give you many predictions I've made in the past that are true, that came true. I brought a list of them in, Gloria. I predict that John Conley will be president of the United States and that Richard Nixon will become uh, a past thing probably, I would say, dead. I think that Ronald Reagan, Spiro Agnew, and John Conley will rule America. And that is a prediction. Take it for what it's worth. Sit on it for three or four years. Get in touch with me in a few years. Now, one of the things that I spoke to the students about at school is the fact that they were too young to remember anything about John Kennedy. So that when you talk about the contrast between the present administration or Lyndon Johnson and John, Ken John Kennedy, it's hard to visualize just what the differences were between these men, and I recommended to the students that they borrow records or listen to speeches to see what the world was going to be like or what the hope was or the promise and see how far we've gone in these years. And this morning's paper had a review of a play that opened up in New York called JFK, and a man comes out in two acts in two different suits, and you see the back of his head, 
and he reads 